Music, Excel, Worksheet, Scales, Intervals, Modes, and more. Get ready and some coffee, because with the help of Excel, music theory will be defeated. Which I know actually makes music theory less attractive to all those foot fetish people. But, you know, for the rest of us, music theory being defeated is actually a good thing, you know? Because, because it makes music theory less stinky. Here we are in Excel. If you don't have access to this workbook, that's okay because we'll basically build this from a blank worksheet and hopefully we'll be able to provide this workbook to you as well so you can use it in whatever way you so choose. However, I do think it's useful to actually construct the workbook both from an Excel theory standpoint and a music theory standpoint. And I do recognize that most people are probably not equally interested in those two topics, Excel and music theory and the people that are interested in Excel I think are probably more open-minded to apply what they're learning to different topics such as music as long as we get to practice putting together our tables looking at the links between the tables putting together our formulas formatting and so on and so forth which we will be doing as we put together uh, this presentation if we're interested in music and music theory it's probably less likely that you're interested in excel however i really do think that excel is a great tool to map out the concepts in music theory and kind of uh, shuffle them around so we can look at them from different angles even just the fretboard i think is mapping out in excel is the best tool to me and, and i'll try to explain that here and uh, even if you're not totally familiar with Excel, we will be walking through building this in a step-by-step -step process. So even some fairly complex formulas and connections between tables, we'll try to map out uh, pretty basically. So hopefully everybody will be able to follow along. However, uh, if you're not interested in Excel, I think it would still be useful to follow along and basically write out these tables just in a piece of paper or on a piece of paper because looking at the relationship between the tables gives you a good idea it gives another angle another view of the concepts related to music theory and how to all all these things kind of tie together which is the one of the reasons that I that I like to do these things because uh, oftentimes I, I realize that uh, when I think I know something I then try to explain it, and when I try to explain it, I realize I don't know it as well as I could because I can't really formulate or articulate what I'm trying to say in a reasonable way. And if I was able to do that, I find that that opens up different connections in my mind and it allows me to rotate concepts around uh, much more easily. So I highly, that's why I call myself like like a, a soul tuber on YouTube, right? So even even if people weren't watching the videos I create or even the courses that I made, I think it's still useful to do because it's a great learning process to better uh, understand uh, things. So I just happen to be lucky enough that I make enough stuff that some of it people find useful enough to make a living on. But even when I wasn't making a living on it, I still kind of tended to do that because like I say, I think it's useful to learn in concepts. That said, I also think that if you wanted to just even take this worksheet, deconstruct it, and remake your own presentations, just, just demonstrating the same concepts, I'm totally okay with people doing that type of thing. Uh, I wouldn't think of it as like plagiarism and whatnot if you're reconstructing uh, uh, the table for, again, multiple reasons. I, I think even if you don't get any views on, on a on a if you were to post it or even if you don't post it to any kind of social media or anything like that you'll be able to better understand it if you put the thing together with a mindset of you're going to try to explain it to somebody and if you do put it up on the social medias or whatnot uh, then a lot of times people are interested even if you don't fully grasp the concept because you're kind of closer to where they are in the learning curve we tend to like to watch people that are closer to kind of to where we are uh in learning things and of course you might have a different demonstration style than someone else like me people might look at me and say hey look he's referring to to movies from like the the 90s and 80s and you can make one yourself and refer to maybe even older movies or you can refer to like TikTok videos or youtube videos or something like that which i would have no 
idea about, but certain niche of audience might. And so that would, so then, so you might be able to reach more people with the same information. Uh, even if like, I don't know, for example, Excel as well as like the Excel is fun guy, at least in terms of the range of knowledge that he has with it, with all the different kind of functionalities uh, with it. But as an accountant and with my own experiences and whatnot, I, I think I have a particular angle on Excel and I think I reach a different audience. So, so I'm, so I, so I think that is useful. And, and I think the same thing would apply on the music side of things. I'm not a music theory expert because I, I haven't been schooled in music or anything like that. I've just been playing the guitar for 20 years or something and trying to put the thing together. And I think that actual perspective is useful uh, to many people and kind of connects differently than than people that have gone through maybe have a lot more formal knowledge. I think learning from both those things are good. You're just going to get different perspectives. So in any, in any case, that's uh, my idea with it. So I put a worksheet on this together before, but I think this one is better. So let me try to explain why I think it is better. And then we'll start uh, building this through our presentations here. Uh, I think it's just more efficient. The tables are more efficient. So I'm not doing as much repetitive stuff uh, on the tables. And then I'm, we're also going to try to put in the modalities in a way into our worksheet that I think is going to be uh, more clear so that we can see the relationship between our different scales more easily as we use our worksheet for like our practice work. We're also going to input the intervals table and try to map out the intervals in such a way that it's going to be easier for us to basically recognize those. I've mapped out the patterns. These are the whole, whole half uh, patterns uh, for each of the modes. And we'll also, we'll also look at basically the relative positions, looking at all the modes and looking at the relative positions compared to the, to the major scale. And I'm going to try to view the modes a little bit differently in our worksheet, which I'll, I'll explain shortly. And then we also have our, our intervals. So we can map, I've mapped out a table here looking at all of the intervals, meaning the distance from the first note in the scale. And this is worksheet in and of itself is a great worksheet just to have in mind because you could start to look at your fretboard and build things out rather than just by memorizing the finger position by looking at the different intervals. And I've noticed a lot of people, that's one way a lot of people kind of approach the guitar, which seems to be very practical, although uh, scary at first. It's a, it's a little, it's a little bit uh, intimidating at first, but bear with me because even though it looks intimidating, it's just like a teddy bear. So it looks scary. It looks scary at first, but it's just, a t it's not, but bear with me because it's just if you get closer, it's just a teddy bear. So then we're going to be putting together our worksheet. So this is the, the meat of it, meaning this is the worksheet I would put together when I'm actually kind of noodling around possibly on the guitar and comparing that to our fretboard. So this is going to be our fretboard in numbers. And this is going to be the same thing with uh, the letters. Now, noting my, my theory here on the fretboard, is that this is basically tablature when I map out the fretboard, but I'm going to put the low string on top, which is which you might say, well, the high string should go on top. And so let me map. I've explained this before. Same theory here that I've done before, but just for people that haven't done the prior worksheet uh, and are on this latest and greatest one. Remember, here's our guitar. And I just want to want to note that how the tablature typically works. If I was trying to map out these strings, if I'm looking at the guitar, this dot represents the low string, which is why when I'm looking at the guitar this way, if I was to, if I was to turn it around this way, now you can see what happens is that low string duh, 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 is, on, is on the bottom. And that's why we end up with these fretboards with tablature with the low E string with the low E string on the bottom. Whereas when we play it, we're behind the guitar where the low E string is on the top. So to me, and I, and I'm a little dyslexic, I, or, you know, so this might be a bigger deal to me than in other people, but I really think 
that if you're learning the guitar, it's easier to visualize the tablature as though, as though you're behind the guitar. So this is this is my theory. This is my my contribution, my my music theory movement here. If you wanna if you wanna jump on board with my music music theory movement, which I put some catch phrases for. I call it the top string on top movement. And and that means that I'd like I, if there's any computer programmers and and uh, and like like people that put together databases, I think we should take all the tablature and make it so we have the top string on top. Right. So in other words, like you can see tablature like this. And I see this is more and more popular, which makes more sense to people, I think, because now they're seeing reading it from left to right where the low string is at least on the left now because that makes sense because when I'm looking at the guitar, the low string is on top because I'm behind the guitar. But I think the easiest way to look at it for most people is actually to, to say, I'm gonna view it this way and flip the guitar, which is actually what I do when I, when I use my worksheets instead of, instead of having the guitar facing the other way, I'm gonna flip the guitar. And so, so now, you, you, you end up looking like it's a left-handed guitar, but really you have the, the low string on top now. So, and really with the fretboard, you can, you can kind of imagine as though we have the guitar turned around and then we're imprinting the guitar as though we're behind the guitar, taking the strings face up and planting the strings on here so that the low is, so we're seeing through the back of the guitar. So that means when I, when I put together my presentations, I'm gonna have my fretboard up here, low E string on top, reading from left to right. And then I'm also gonna be playing the guitar, which looks like it's left-handed because I'm gonna flip the guitar. I'm not left-handed, well, I kinda am, but I don't play the guitar left-handed. And then I, and then you can see that when you and then when you see it everything's going from left to right so that means that when you're playing the guitar you can read your your position behind the guitar from left to right when you're looking at the tablature you're looking at it from left to right with the low string on top and and uh and and when you're looking at my guitar that i'm playing it looks like i'm left-handed but it's going from left to right so that's going to be my idea that's my that's my top string on top music movement uh that i'm putting together and so anybody who's on anybody who i think we should be taking all tablature and uh making the top string on top with it and making a database in case anyone's interested in that okay so now the other thing i advocate for here is also having the absolute numbers of the notes and if i know if i number the notes there's only 12 notes then I have something that I can use some math equations for. That takes a little bit more memorization because now I have to be able to switch from code switching from number to letter, but it gives me the ability to do simple math, making intervals easier to deal with. So we'll talk about that later. And then the worksheet over here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna map out the notes in the key that I'm in. I'm gonna do it numerically first, so these are absolute numbers, and then we'll use the V look, uh, X lookup table to pull in the information down here. Now this worksheet is similar to the one that I've done in the past, but it's more streamlined. It doesn't have as much stuff up top, and that means the fretboard is, is almost the same size as this. This is only one cell longer, which allows us to ha have multiple of these fretboards on top of each other, which is one of one of the benefits. So I can see I can map out things on one fretboard and then map out the same thing on another fretboard, which we'll take a look at shortly. Now to construct this thing, I'm going to say that that we're going to start with the key of C because the key of C is a good check figure to make sure that we're not making mistakes because if we end up with anything that's has a sharp or flat in it, we know there's an error. So we have like an internal control, kind of like the double entry accounting system, right? It needs to be in balance. Well, in the key of C, you need to have everything not having sharps and flats. And, and that's going to give us a double check, an internal control to make sure that everything is, is mapping out correctly. Once we've mapped it out correctly for the key of C, 
then I should be able to simply change the key with this blue bit up here, changing it to any other key. So if I go up to uh, five or six is gonna be a D, right? And I'll talk about the numbering system in a second. It should uh, apply out properly as long as I got all the formulas in there correctly, which hopefully we have. So, so then I've got the numbering system. So we have seven out of 12 notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, I also want to start thinking about the modal, the modes, because usually when we count this out, we, we say, okay, if I was to build a chord on this, we're going to say the one is major, the two is minor, the three is minor, the three is, ma the four is major, the five is major, the six is minor, and the seven is diminished. Sometimes people often represent this by saying, I'm going to have the Roman numerals upper and lower case. So this uppercase one represents that if I was to build a chord off of this one note, it would be a major chord, a triad that is. If I was to build a chord off of this one because it has a lowercase Roman numeral two, it would be a minor triad. This one has a Roman numeral three, so the third is a minor. And then this one has a capital Roman numeral, so it would be a major. This would be a major and then a minor and then a diminished which means it's not just the third that's the distinguishing factor, but also the, the flat fifth. So, the, so, so that's good, but really that's only telling us what's going on with the third here, basically, down to the diminished, which has a flat fifth as well, because it's basically telling us the interval of the third, which is distinguishing, that's the distinguishing factor for the triads, three note chords, the major triads having a four note away major third, the minor triads having uh, a three note away minor third. But when you look at it that way, you start to think that like, for example, this two right here, if I was looking at the major scale, which is what this is mapped off on, and I'm gonna use like most people in Western music do, the major scale as our kind of key that we're, is, is our, that we're always gonna compare everything to. Noting though, that it's really just another mode. I could use any of the other scales as the key to compare everything to. It's just that of course, the major scale is the most common key. So it's, and it's pretty much universally used as the thing we compare everything to. So that's why we're, we'll use that one. So if I'm in the key of C, which could also be, which is also the Ionian scale from a modal uh, standpoint, I can look at these notes. These are seven out of 12 notes, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and I can map it out this way, but I can also map it out this way. So here's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If I map it out this way, I'm gonna say we're starting on the C, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Now, what is this going out over here? There's only seven, but I'm going to the nine, 10, and the 11. Why do I do that? Because usually when we build the, the chords, what we do is take every other note. So I'm gonna say this, we have the C, we have the one, we have the three, and then we have the five. And that's gonna be the triad. But I could keep going and take the seven. Now I can keep going from there, but I have no, nothing else to skip and go back to. Really what I'm doing is I'm picking back up the two, which is a D but I'm not gonna call it the two because that would be confusing because I'm taking the one, three, five. Instead, I'm gonna call it the nine. So I'm gonna call it a nine. That means the nine is equivalent in essence, at least in tone to the two. And the 11 is equivalent to the four. And the 13 is equivalent to, uh, the 13 is equiv equivalent to the six. Now note that you can see this if we make a circle out of it even easier, right? So here I have the same notes, C, D, E, F, uh, G, A, B, back to C. If I go in a circle, I can go, here's my C, I skip that to go to the E, and then I skip that to go to the G, there's my triad, but if I keep going, I could skip this and go to the B, now I've run out of notes, but if it's in a circle, I skip the C again and I go back to the D, which is the second, but I'm not gonna call it the second. I'm, I started, I was on seven, I'm gonna call it the nine. And then I skip the E and I go back to the F, and then I skip the G and I go back to the A. Now I've basically just mapped out all of the notes that are in you know, the key 
but I did so by skipping every other note. That's going that's basically what we do uh, with the 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 chord construction. So that means that these are kind of repetitory. If I want to look at it in terms of chords, I could just hide. I can hide the two, right? And say, I'm going to hide this. I'm going to hide the four. And I'm going to hide the six. So that now I have just this format. I've got the one, three, five, and then seven, nine, 11, and 12, noting that the nine, 11, and 12 are equivalent to, in essence, the two, the four, and the six, right? That's the general, that's the general idea. So I'm gonna unhide, but then I can unhide those and say unhide, and I can also see this in terms of the related modalities, because if I look at the Dorian, we say that that has been constructed in a minor, it's a minor, chord. So I actually, we think of major, minor, which is represented by the lowercase Roman numeral, minor, major, major, minor, and then the diminished. That's going to be, if we were to make chords in the key of C, those are the chords that we, we could basically make in terms of triads. But when I look at the second one, it is a minor, but really it's, I'm not really thinking of it in terms of if we're looking at the related mode, it's not the related Aeolian or minor mode, it's the Dorian mode, which is a minor mode, right? And so in other words, if I, if I took these notes, I started on the two and counted down, just like if, then, then, then I can do that crossways this way, right? So I'm basically starting on the D and just counting the same notes, all the natural notes, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And, and, and so, so, so this is basically the same notes in the Dorian. So in other words, I can think of the two note as basically mapping out the Dorian. And it's a minor mode because if I took the one, three, five, this third has a minor third a three note away minor third instead of a four note away and so but it's not really the the minor scale that we're thinking about it's kind of the dorian scale whereas this one is a phrygian also a minor mode so if i took if i started on this e and i took the same notes e f g a b c d same notes and it creates a minor chord if i take the one three five because this third is once again a minor third away as opposed to a major third but i'm not really looking at the minor the e minor scale if it's the related mode to the c major i'm looking at the phrygian mode which you can see if you took if you added more than just three notes if we mapped out the seventh the nine and and the 13 uh the seven the nine and the third you're going to have intervals that are different than, than the intervals on the Aeolian or minor mode. And then the Lydian is a major mode, which means if you build a one, three, five on it, the third is gonna have a major third. But it's not like when we go over here to the, to the F, we're gonna build an F major triad, uh, but it's not really the F major scale, it's really a major mode, it's the Lydian mode. So if I went to the seventh, the ninth, the eleventh, and the twelfth, they would have different intervals possibly than the Ionian and then the Mixolydian again major mode the triad that we would built on it has has right and then here's the my, the Aeolian is the minor mode so this one would build a minor triad and it would actually be the full minor minor scale right and then you've got the Locrian which is the weird one which has a minor third and a flat fifth so that's why I think this is a little bit more detailed. And then we've got the intervals. Now this is mapping out the intervals and I'm gonna give the intervals as compared to the root, uh, in this case, the C. So each of these positions, you can call this a perfect first. The second is gonna be a major second, which is two notes away. That's what that two stands for up front. And then this is a four note away. This E is four notes away from the C. That's why the eight minus the four is useful, which makes it a major third. And then this is a perfect fourth because it's five notes away. And this nine minus the four would make that apparent. And then this one is a 
perfect fifth, which is seven notes away, 11 minus four. And this one is uh, major six, which is nine notes away, which is a little confusing because this one, you can think of it as like a 13 or right, because it goes around the horn. So when you're looking at the distance, there's only 12 notes. And then this one's a major uh, seven, which is 11 notes away. So we can think about it in terms of intervals. And I think this is a cleaner way to map out the intervals than what I had before. And then of course, on this worksheet, we can then highlight this worksheet and use our, so if I wanted to put these side by side and play my guitar with it and try to map this out onto my fretboard and say, okay, I'm gonna hide maybe this, I'm gonna hide this, and then I can hide this, and then I can hide this and put these together. And then maybe I wanna map out uh, just the, the triad here on my fretboard. So I can take my fretboard and, and notice, like I might not need the full fretboard, but I don't have to hide anything over here like I did before because, because I can just look at the fretboard I need. So that's another reason I think this construction is better. But if I highlight this and I can go to my conditional formatting, home tab, style, conditional formatting, and I'm gonna say I wanna make this equal to the C, I'm gonna make that green. So there's my root. And then I wanna make this equal to do, 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 the uh, E here. Let's make that red. And then I wanna make this equal to the G and let's make that yellow. So now I can map out the the one, three, five, just like we, we saw in my prior worksheet as well. And I could hide the worksheet below, hide this one so I don't see the numbers part. I'm gonna hide that. And so now I have the related mode right underneath it. So, so this is just taking, this is the same notes here, which are now here, but now I'm seeing it as this is, this is the Dorian mode. And, and I can also map out now, if that's the Dorian, I'm gonna call the Dorian mode number two, and I'm gonna label it with an with a, with a II because that shows that it's a minor mode, meaning it's gonna have a minor triad that uh, it starts off with. And that gives me a, an ability to see the related mode to its major, right? So if I say I'm in D Dorian, it's related to the the C, you know, major, right? So these are all the same notes here, but I'm just reorganizing it. And I have another fretboard, which I can then map out based on the Dorian, or I can map it out based on this information up top as well, and be able to have these fretboards close enough together that they're pretty easily seen together. I can even hide one more here, and then, and then I can see them kind of right on top of each other. So that gives me an easy way to see the modes. I can hide all of these, these ones hide, and then I can see all of the modes on top of each other, hide like this, du, 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 du. hide, and then mixolydian, and then here's the aeolian, hide, and then, and so on. So now I can see each of these modes hide. Actually, I don't need this top bit. I can just hide that whole thing, hide. Now I can see each of the modes kind of on top of each other. So, and, and maybe I should have kept the space, but you have the space between the fretboards and I have multiple fretboards that I can then work on and possibly map out different chords that I'm looking at that are in the same, uh, the same, the same worksheet over here or that are pop possibly part of the different modes. So I think that's more efficient than what I had before. Whereas all the modes, all the related modes were on the side on, and I had to scroll to the right to find them. Uh, but I can also, the other common thing is to see, I want to see the modes. I want to see the related modes. So if this was a, I want to switch not from the C major to the, to the D Dorian, but from the C major to the D, uh, to the C Dorian. So I can have the complementary modes by just changing my key. So I'm going to unhide this. 
And so unhide this bit up top, unhide. So now if this is a four, I could say, okay, instead of changing this to a six, which is the second, which is done automatically, I'm gonna change this to keep it to be the four. So now what happens is, is that's gonna convert the second bit to be in the key of C. So now I have the Dorian, but it's not in the related mode. It's in the, I think it's called the complementary mode. So, so now, I'm, I'm calc now I'm calculating the Dorian in the key of C instead of in the key of D, which is the other common way to look at these things, right? We could see it and, and I could switch that instead of, instead of having the related modes on the right and then the complementary modes underneath or something like that, I could just switch the key so that I, so that I can have either one that I want, right? So I can, I can say this is either gonna be the Dorian, which will be the default, so they're all related modes, or I think it's called the complementary mode. I can keep that in the key of C. And so now I've got the Dorian in the key of C and I can do that all the way down uh, if I so choose. So it's a little bit more, it's a little less automated that way, but I think that uh, is a little bit cleaner to work with. So that's the general, that's the general idea. So what are we gonna do to construct this? We will start off with just the, the alphabet I'm going to say A, and I'm going to sh represent sharps and flats with just a lowercase of the two, because this can be a, a, an A sharp or a B flat. So I'm going to call that lowercase A, B, just for Excel purposes, because I think that's easy to do. B, C, and then C sharp, D flat, D, uh, D sharp, E flat, E, F, F sharp, G flat, G, and then uh, G sharp or A flat, and then it goes back to A. I'm going to number those. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And these are absolute numbers, and I would like to. I think it's useful to be able to go back code switching in your head from the letters to the numbers, and and that allows you to do some simple math in some situations. Which is why on the fretboard, I'm going to represent these items with both the letter and the number. Then I'm going to map out the modes. So we have seven modes because it, it's, it's going to correspond to like all the notes in each of the scales. We can compare it to the major scale, which has seven notes in it. Each note kind of represents, as we saw in our worksheet, a mode. If we were to build out the mode from that note. And I'm going to label the modes shorthand just like we do with the notes in the major scale. Major, minor, minor, major major, minor, diminished. And I'm gonna label them with an uppercase Roman numeral and lowercase Roman numeral, lowercase Roman numeral four, uppercase Roman numeral five. And those numbers then are gonna tell me if I see, even if I, if I see this, this number uppercase four, I'm gonna assign that when thinking about modes to the Lydian mode, even if the Lydian mode is being represented in another, in a different mode in a, in a worksheet, right? That's gonna be because I'm gonna compare everything to the major scale because that's our general convention. So that's gonna be my idea there. And then we have the intervals. So this is going to be uh, the interval numbers. We can have an interval of zero uh, to 12. These are distances between notes. And then we'll name what those di differences are. We'll give the abbreviation. And then we'll try to say, this is giving me both the distance in half steps and the abbreviated name of that interval, which is something that I don't think you see a lot of times because they just give you the interval and people aren't really looking at the distance. And if you don't know what that is, you're going to confuse yourself. Then we'll build up this table, which will give us the, the, the intervals between each step in each scale, whole, whole, or two note, two note, half, whole, 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 half, I'll repeat it, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half, and this also can be repeated this way, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. This worksheet will help us to then use that information to build this over here, and then we have the, the relative modes. So in other words, I'm gonna look at, if I'm looking at, at the Dorian, this is the first of the Dorian, the first note in the Dorian scale is equivalent to the second of the major scale. 
the second note in the Dorian scale is related to the third note of the major scale. So hope that's I'll map that out and that will allow me to build this table from that table. We're using uh, v, uh, X lookups here to do these. So we'll practice our Excel skills to pull this off. So it starts off with the Dorian and then the two is going to be a Phrygian and then the Lydian. So we'll look at the related modes. That might be confusing right now, but if we build these, I think that'll help us to understand that. And then we'll take a look at the total intervals in terms of half steps from the root note. We're basically pulling this information and then looking at the intervals per step up top to build this. So there's a relationship between those tables. And then we're gonna use our X lookup table to take these intervals and name them by cross-referencing that with our with our with our with our table over here. And then we'll use that stuff to build to build these tables. And so we're using our if logical functions to build these and our X lookups over here to build these. We're also going to have to use some Roman numerals and lowercase functions to build these. So we'll have some interplay between tables and some interesting formulas from an Excel perspective.